evening, I'd like to introduce Margaret Weidekamp. She's the curator in the Museum Division of Space History here. She has a number of graduate degrees and has received numerous awards. And uh, Dr. Weidekamp oversees the collections of space memorabilia and space science objects, fiction, science fiction objects. Uh, she has a job I wouldn't have for any amount of money. <laughs> how do you go? How do you have a flight come back from space? and make the decisions on what is historically significant to hang on to and what turns up as a heap of space junk that just came back. And that's what her job is to determine what's important on this or not, and she does a great job with it. Uh, among her duties is coordination of this annual lecture series also. Margaret, we appreciate your efforts. Dr. Margaret Weidekamp. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Glenn. It is indeed an honor, a privilege, to coordinate the Glenn Lecture in Space History this year as we commemorate the 40th anniversary of Apollo 11. Our speakers this evening, the crew of that historic mission, and Dr. Christopher Kraft have graciously agreed to share with us their thoughts on the significance of Apollo 11 and American space flights to the moon. Our first speaker this evening will be Dr. Kraft. As NASA's first flight director for human space flights, Christopher C. Kraft, Jr. enjoyed a first-hand perspective on the early years of American human space flight. Many of you have probably enjoyed his insights into NASA's early history in his 2001 autobiography, Flight, My Life in Mission Control. Dr. Kraft served as director of NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston from 1972 to 1982, and then worked as an aerospace consultant after his retirement from NASA. He has spoken at the museum before, and we are honored to have him back with us again this evening. Please welcome Dr. Chris Kraft. I'm going to see if I can do that without this stuff that's in front of me. Uh, it's indeed an honor to be here tonight. Uh, it's a great day 40 years ago. It's an honor to be involved in this great evening with the three men who did the job. They are great Americans and uh, they deserve the highest praise. My job is supposed to be tonight to set the stage, so I'll try to do that. The Russians in 1957 as we all know, started this whole business with orbiting a satellite known as Sputnik. They had it on page 37 of their newspaper. The sec next day, after every newspaper in the world had it on the front page, they put it on the front page. And in the spring of 1961, following that, there was a great deal of turmoil in the space program but even more in the U.S. Everyone was concerned about what was happening with the Russians. The president was having sleepless nights. And in 1961, the U.S. space program was also, which was created to start man's advancement into space, was attempting to launch the first human into space, Alan Shepard. Uh, it was a competition with the Russians. The, the press drove that immensely. Uh, many times we were very unhappy about that. But nevertheless, we were struggling to make a safe launch of the first astronaut into a suborbital flight. Now, the second flight in Project Mercury, which was previous to that, was a very interesting flight because uh, on the, sitting on the top of a redstone was a chimpanzee named Ham. And he was there because we had to prove before we could put humans in space that we would indeed would not kill the chimpanzee. Unfortunately, as that flight took place uh, on a rocket built by German engineers in the U.S. Army, the rocket cut off early, and as a result, the 
escape system created 17 G-force on the, both the chimpanzee and the spacecraft. He was pretty damn unhappy about that. <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, at the same time, it ruined the mechanism of the device that was supposed to test him so that we could, when he got through, prove that he could do a job in space. And as a result, even though he continued, it was a slight interruption in his work, but even though he continued, he was supposed to get a shock if he did the wrong thing and a banana pellet if he did, it did the right thing. And no matter what he did, and he did it correctly, he got a shock. <laughs> and as a result of landing 100 miles downrange and a slight hole in the bottom of his spacecraft, by the time we got there, he was pretty damn mad and also pretty wet. Now, we in operations considered that to be a very successful flight. <laughs> we did everything we were there to do. We got the chimpanzee back, and he'd done a very good job. But a lot of people didn't see it that way, and particularly the uh, medical community who had not yet believed that man could do a job in space and as a result they said we want you to test a certain number of chimpanzees at the Johnsville centrifuge to destruction before we'll let you fly Alan Shepard. Now fortunately or unfortunately whichever way you look at it several weeks later a gentleman named Yuri Gagarin flew in space and not only did he not do a suborbital flight, he did an orbital flight. And fortunately, the part that was fortunate about it, the, the doctors quickly decided that it was okay for us to put Alan Shepard in space in a suborbital flight. And by the way, that was done in the glare of the real-time press. So while all of that was taking place, the Russians indeed scored a, key, a coup as far as the U.S. space program was concerned. However, several weeks later we flew Alan Shepard. And that was truly a successful flight, but it was also a, a surprise to the President of the United States and a lot of other people that the response of the United States was high praise. They thought it was a wonderful thing, and it was a hell of a propaganda coup for the United States. As a result, uh, the president called NASA to, I'm paraphrasing here a little bit, called NASA to his, to his offices, and he'd been asking his staff, well, what might we do in space that would ace the Russians? And so the learned fathers of NASA said, well, we could probably fly around the moon in about 10 years. And the president's response for that, that's not very exciting. Why don't you land on the moon? And so two weeks later, all the NASA people got their slide rules out and whatever they had and said, okay, that's what we were proposing to do. If that's what you want us to do, if you are willing to make that commitment, so are we. Now, I don't know whether you, what you think our response to that was, but frankly, it scared the hell out of me. Uh, we didn't know anything about space flight at that point in time. We had still not put Mr. Glenn in orbit. Uh, we didn't know how to do orbit determination with the radar data we had, but suddenly somebody was asking us to do the orbital mechanics associated with going to the moon. We had to do tracking and communications at lunar distances. The surface properties of the moon were totally unknown, and many scientists in this country thought you would sink into six feet of dust. Many thought it would caught on, catch on fire due to the flame that came from the devices and we had to figure out how to do a hell of a lot of other things. Now, it also s sent us all back to reading Jules Verne. 
because we didn't know really how to go into space. And many people had great ideas, but the two, two ideas that came into view were direct descent, as we fired a big rocket from the Earth and shot it at the moon just like Jules Verne did, and land. The other technique was you put everything into Earth orbit, rendezvous, put it all together, and then fire it to the moon and land. And as we began to look at that, and everybody in the country did that had anything to do with going into space, many of the universities, we all came up with these great huge rockets called NOVA, and there were many rocket systems that were being thought of. Well, fortunately, a small group of very smart guys at the Langley Research Center started looking at what they might do to overcome this tremendous amount of mass that would have to be sent towards the moon. And they decided that the best way to do that was to take a bug, as they call it, and orbit it around the moon with uh, a mothership, send it down to the moon, land, and take off again in the bug, and then re-rendezvous with the spaceship called the mothership at that point in time. Now, I would, as it was first thought of by all these people who had been thinking the other way, they thought they were crazy. They literally thought those people were crazy to think that we could do rendezvous around the moon. But as they began to recognize the reduction in weight, and set a certain amount of intrigue to it. And eventually, that's how all the people decided that we would do it and call it lunar orbit rendezvous. The men sitting here tonight were thankful that that happened. Now, as we th begin to, began to think about that, however, and yet had not flown the first man in orbit with Mercury, we recognized that we probably had to do a lot of learning. And that's when we conceived the Gemini spacecraft. It was actually a two-man version of the Mercury spacecraft. It would allow us to do hopefully rendezvous and docking in space for the first time. It would allow us to use something besides batteries as power, known as a fuel cell. It would help us to find out if man could survive for 14 days at zero gravity. It would help us to do EVA, which Mr. Aldrin here practiced valiantly on, a, on Gemini 12 and proved it could be done. Uh, it developed, we had to develop new spacesuits which would allow the men to survive in uh, while working in space. And all of these new requirements uh, were operations that eventually we would have to do around the moon. And in a sense then, Gemini was a proving ground for Apollo. Now I don't have enough time to describe Gemini, and so I won't. <laughs> and I want to talk about, however, how we got to Apollo. Because while many of us in the operations world and some engineers were still working on Gemini and Apollo, the Apollo program came into being. And this was a whole new concept to these people. Many of these people had never had any experience in space flight. They came from all kinds of other engineering walks of life. But they had been given the task to very quickly come up to speed and start building a spacecraft. And frankly, they built a damn lousy spacecraft. They were running like the devil, trying to get it done. They didn't have time to listen to lessons learned. And it was quite a turmoil in 1967 when it, we sent three men to their death on a pad at Cape Canaveral. It was a terrible day, a very terrible day to watch that happen. And we had a NASA committee that looked at what was wrong, and everything was wrong. It was poor workmanship, poor wiring, poor redundancy concepts, et cetera. And so we had a, re a regrouping of NASA following Mr. Thompson's review of that program. And one of the first meetings we had with George Lowe as the new program manager was a meeting to decide what we needed to do. And we listed 125 things that 
had to be done to make that spacecraft viable. And we did that. We worked our fannies off and we got it done, along with the many contractors in this country. And in 1967, after having done that and getting, getting ourselves ready to go, it took a lot of guts, frankly. We had to rebuild the industry, had to rebuild ourselves, and we had to rebuild the spacecraft. And fortunately, in, 19, in the summer of 1968, after recognizing that we were ready to fly the spacecraft, we flew Apollo 7 and Apollo 8. Apollo 8 was indeed a pivotal program. It was without Apollo 8, I think we would have been hard pushed to learn how to do Apollo 11 in the time we did. And also, I want to say, that although the death of those three men was a terrible thing in our memory, without the fire, I guarantee you we would still be trying to get to the moon because that was not going to happen with the hardware we had. So we quickly done, did Apollo 9 and Apollo 10, and Apollo 11 happened, and the gentleman here tonight will tell you about that. I want to spend the rest of my time tonight talking a little bit about the problems that NASA is struggling with today, because I think that's important. First, in 1915, the NACA was established, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. And I want you to know that something like 80 to 100 percent of the vehicles that are in this museum had their roots in the NACA. I want to think about that. All of these flying machines that you see around you had their roots in the NACA. Now, the, the NASA programs that we did in the 60s had a great deal of payoff. We didn't invent everything that happened in Apollo, but it was the demands of, product, of, produ of the products, of the perfection, of the reliability, of the performance, of the mass, of the reduction in power that brought about a spike, and in my opinion, the greatest advancement in the state of the art in technology in the history of man. It was the NASA programs that drove that. So I say we can call that return on investment. Every company in the United States has a capital expenditure. I've served on a number of boards, and that's our whole life. Their whole future depends on making an investment with capital funds every year. And they're looking for a return on investment. NASA is the best return on investment that this country has ever seen, and is today the best government agency to get a return on investment. And it is where our future lies. So, the point I want to make is that we need to make an investment in new technology in NASA. There are all kinds of ways to use that technology. Everybody's got his ideas, and Buzz will tell you a bunch of them tonight about how to get there and how to use it. There are a lot of other people that do that. But what we need is new technology. We have not made that investment since Apollo. All the programs that NASA has had has demanded that they spend the money on the programs as opposed to spending, putting money into technology for the future. In, in Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, we spent about 10 percent of our monies on the future. Fuel cells, thermal protection systems, the communication satellite and computers change the whole world in which we live. That's what we need today. We need an investment in the future 
and a return on investment which we can see and provide to the country. So I say to Mr. Obama, let's get on with it. Let's invest in the future.